Good morning, everybody, and welcome to King's Church Upfield Online, to our very first gathering of 2021. It's lovely to have you with us, whether you're a regular member of the church watching from afar, as I know some people do, or just maybe peeping in to see what goes on. I don't know about you, but we've still got quite a few presents underneath our tree. Not the mini version, which I have in the background here, but the rather larger one around the corner. And it seems somewhat symbolic of the fact that we really don't know what 2021 holds, do we? We don't really know how life will unfold almost from week to week. We just know, I trust, the peace and grace of God as we go through the challenges, experience, the challenging experiences of this time. And uh, that affects our own meetings as well. Just to bring you up to date, we had originally envisaged starting to meet more regularly at the Civic Centre and live streaming into homes in a similar way to this um, as of sometime in January. But we put those plans on hold for the moment. It's not uh, appropriate or sensible to try and do that at the moment. So we can continue as we are on YouTube and on Facebook Live week by week. Now, I can still have my Christmas tree up because we haven't reached the end of the 12 days of Christmas yet. I think it's the 10th day and uh, we would have lined up 10 pipers piping, but tier four put an end to that. So instead, Tris and Lauren are going to lead our worship this morning uh, in just a couple of minutes time. But um, I'd like to just make one little comment before I hand over to them. And I remember as a worship leader myself, um, and talking with others in a similar position. You know, the first Sunday of the year was always one of the most challenging to lead worship, both personally to sort of get yourself psychologically and spiritually prepared for it, but also looking out over um, a congregation of people who'd spent quite a lot of time doing quite a lot of eating and sitting around and maybe some drinking and um, it was difficult to get up for it, to be motivated for it. Like some of our football teams over this Christmas period being criticised by their managers for not being motivated enough. Well, we have a motivator like no other. We have the Holy Spirit within us as believers. So I'd like to encourage uh, you this morning, even though we're not spread out like a congregation in front of Tris and Lauren as they lead some worship songs, but uh, let's enter into worship and praise. Let's allow the Holy Spirit who lives within us to motivate us and to remind us of the glorious character of God, the wonderful uh, things that he has done through us in bringing us salvation. And let's allow that to draw us into not only worship this morning, but let's allow that to draw us into the new year and into fresh uh, passion, excitement, dedication and commitment to all that God has prepared for us. There are going to be some very exciting things happening for us as individuals, for us as a church and around our world over the course of 2021. Let's be at the heart of that and now God by his Holy Spirit to lead us into that. That, in fact, is very much the theme of our new teaching series, which Aid will be kicking off after this worship time. We're going to be looking over the coming weeks at the work of the Holy Spirit in the early church in the book of Acts. So that's what Aid will be sharing about a little later. But now let's hand over to Tris and Lauren and let's give ourselves to worship. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of
Yet you left the gaze of angels Came to seek and save the lost And exchanged the joy of heaven For the anguish of a cross With a prayer you fed the hungry With a word you stilled the sea Yet how silently you suffered That the guilty may go free You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out across the land With a shout you rose victorious Wrestling victory from the grave And ascended into heaven Leading captives in your way Now you stand before the Father Interceding for your own From each tribe and tongue and nation You are leading sinners home You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out across the land The beauty of a sunset glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah What can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do A Hallelujah, a hallelujah Humanity and suffered by our side Of the cross they nailed you to That could not hold you Now you're making all things new By the power of your risen life What can I do but thank you What can I do but give my life to you Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do but praise you every day, make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, what can I do but thank you, what can I do but give my life to you. Everything I do Hallelujah Hallelujah New Year greetings to you everyone It's a privilege this morning to be able to speak as we start this series together, fully equipped a people inspired by the Spirit, and I trust it will really uh, encourage you over the next weeks. The graphic for this new series is someone evidently ready to embark on a quite uh, challenging climb in the mountains. They look suitably equipped, don't they? I wonder if you've ever tried to do something without the right equipment for the task in hand. Staying with the mountain theme, years ago I remember walking in the Lake District and I was not really adequate, adequately equipped for the job. 
I recall setting out to climb one of the highest peaks after only having a light salad lunch and I quickly realised there wasn't enough fuel in the tank as my energy levels flagged. Somehow I did make it to the top though. On another occasion, uh, in the same week, uh, as I was walking in the lakes, I was wearing a pair of old trainers and the waterlogged conditions were treacherous and I kept slipping and sliding. I didn't have the right footwear. Overall, I got away with uh, these shortcomings, but imagine setting out on an expedition to climb Mount Everest without the right gear, without the full package of specialist equipment. We are talking Mission Impossible, aren't we? Maybe some of you feel like much of what the Bible seems to present as the normal Christian life is beyond you. Knowing and enjoying God's presence, really? Is that possible? Having an appetite to read the Bible, oh come on. Freedom in praise and worship, you must be joking. A passion to call out to God in prayer, pull the other one will you? A boldness in sharing my faith with others, now you're just being silly. Well, it might feel to you like you are being asked to climb Mount Everest without the ability to do so in those areas and others besides. Well, in this series, we're going to look at how the book of Acts shows us that because of the Holy Spirit's enabling, we can indeed know God's help to take us beyond our natural selves. He doesn't expect us to do it in our own strength. He's provided all that we need that we might be equipped to do so. And it's by way of the empowering of the person of the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to look at the opening passage of the book of Acts where Jesus tells his followers that they dare embark on their mission to proclaim his name far and wide without the promised gift of the Holy Spirit to empower them to do so. He doesn't expect them to do it without this divine equipping. And we're going to look at how we need the same power from God in order to live the Christian life that he would wish us to live. So if you have a Bible, please join with me in turning to the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts. Uh, it's called Acts because it's seen as the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the first followers of Jesus. Really, it's the Acts of the Apostles um, through the means of the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm reading from verse one of the very first chapter of the book of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he pre presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will, be, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has take, been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Let me set the scene then for this first episode in the book of Acts. Jesus has been raised from the dead, as he said he would be, and he is spending time with his followers. And in this time, Luke tells us that he is teaching them about, in verse three, the kingdom of God. More about that in a moment. In verse four, Jesus tells the apostles not to leave Jerusalem, where they are currently based, until they have received the gift his heavenly father promised, foretold in the Old Testament, the gift of the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in verse five that whilst John, John the Baptist, baptized in water, in a few days, these same people, these followers will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then in verse eight, Jesus makes it clear that this baptism in the Holy Spirit will be the source 
of divine power that they will need in order to fulfil their mission. After he has told them these things, Luke tells us that in verse 9, um, Jesus was taken up in what represents his departure from this earth and his return to heaven, what's called the ascension going up, something that happened 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, before moving on to look at how the baptism in the Holy Spirit that Jesus refers to revolutionises our Christian lives, it is important to lay a foundation of vital truth concerning the ascension of Jesus, the event that takes place at the end of this passage, leading to what the Bible calls Jesus' glorification in heaven or his enthronement, if you like. I recall a job interview I had uh, for my first teaching post years ago and I remember the head teacher making a thoroughly disparaging remark about my most rec recent qualification from university saying that it was hardly relevant uh, to what I would be doing in her school. In my rather stunned state I didn't answer as I should have done and I should have said that in actual fact this last seemingly irrelevant item on my CV would arguably be the most important as it was going to be highly applicable in forming all of my teaching. I wonder what you think is the most important part of what we could call Jesus' CV. I expect most would opt for one of these three, his birth, his death or resurrection. Obviously these are all really important aren't they? But I'd imagine very few would mention the occasion of his ascension, of his, his return to heaven that we just have seen in the passage and what we can call his enthronement at the right hand of the Father, his glorification, meaning that he is then in the position to pour out the promised Holy Spirit. In these first 11 verses of Acts, there are three big concepts that we might not necessarily realise are crucially connected. These are, in order of appearance, the kingdom of God that Jesus is teaching his followers about, his promise regarding the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus' ascension. How then do these things fit together? Well, we need to understand that based on the Old Testament prophets, the expectation of the Jews was that the kingdom of God, his rule and reign, would decisively break in with the coronation of the promised Messiah, the anointed one, a new great king in the line of David. And this occasion of the coronation of such a king would usher in a new age of the spirit of God powerfully present with his people. That's what they longed for. And this all becomes clearer as we move forward to Acts chapter 2. You see, 10 days after Jesus' ascension back to heaven, on the occasion of the Jews gathered in their capital city for the festival of Passover, when they remembered the giving of the law at Sinai, what Jesus spoke about soon happening in a few days does indeed happen. The promised gift of the Holy Spirit is wonderfully poured out as the followers of Jesus are duly waiting and praying. In the message that Peter then proclaims to the amazed onlookers, as this first group spill onto the streets, he explains the significance of what has just taken place. So we're looking now at Acts 2, verses 33 to 36. Peter proclaims these words to the listeners. He says, exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David, King David, did not ascend to heaven. But the one who comes after as the great David has, that's what he's talking about. And yet David said, and he's quoting from Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ, or Lord and Messiah, Lord and Anointed One. This promised King in the line of David. Do you see 
base, no doubt, on what Jesus has spent time over these 40 days teaching his followers. Peter has come to understand that Jesus has been throned at the right hand of God as the ultimate Davidic king, the promised Messiah, and that as a result, the kingdom rule and reign of God has broken in decisively and the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out. So because Jesus, the Messiah, has been enthroned in heaven, the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out so that we can be equipped with all that we need to be agents of the kingdom of God, seeing God's rule and reign advance in our lives and through our lives. And this will be what the church has as its mandate until Jesus comes back, as we live in the age of the Spirit. So, having laid this crucial foundation about Jesus, let's now focus on what we could call, in terms of the building analogy, the superstructure. The foundation underpins everything, that's what I've explained, but now we have a superstructure, the bit above ground of the building, as it were. And this is the crucial point, my friends, for today. This is the crucial point of all that Jesus was saying uh, to his disciples as he taught them before he ascended. The baptism in the Holy Spirit truly revolutionises our Christian lives. Let me repeat that. The baptism in the Holy Spirit truly revolutionises our Christian lives. We're going to think about Jesus as the one who baptises in the Spirit. We're going to think about the transformed first Christians that we see in the book of Acts. We're going to think about then my experience. And then I'm going to ask you, uh, where do you stand? Are you living in the good of this promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit? So first of all, Jesus is the one who baptises in the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, Jesus says these words, John baptised in water, but in a few days you'll be, you be baptised in the Holy Spirit. He's talking about John the Baptist who baptised people in the River Jordan, including Jesus himself. John, when he saw Jesus coming towards him, um, when Jesus was baptised, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's talking about how Jesus will deal with sin. That's important. That's about the cross, isn't it? But then a few verses later, he also says of Jesus, Jesus, he will be the one who baptises with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came to take away our sin. Praise God. That needs dealing with desperately. But he also came to baptise with the Holy Spirit. And we need both in our gospel understanding. That's the good news. That's what radically transforms human beings like you and I. Our sin is taken away, but also we are baptised with the Holy Spirit. Just as baptism in water is a totally immersive experience, as you go under the water, every single part of your anatomy is submerged, isn't it? That's baptism in water. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is comparable in terms of the reality of God's presence and power coming to us, to fill us. That's why the language is used by Jesus and by John the Baptist. We are to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the one who baptises us in the Holy Spirit. He's ascended, he reigns and he wants to pour out his spirit. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He wants to baptise you in the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus as the one who baptises in the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. <laughs> so look at the Gospels, consider Jesus, who he is and what he did. And wouldn't you want his Spirit in you? If you had my Spirit in you, you would um, go to bookshops and look around the shelves to check that they had the books that you already had. That would render it a good bookshop. You would discover a new walk on the South Downs in the Christmas holidays and proceed to take your family there every other day because you liked it so much. That's the sort of person you would be if you had my spirit. Well, my friends, the Holy Spirit is the person of Jesus. Rest assured, uh, the Holy Spirit is not my spirit. What about the transformed first Christians in the book of Acts? So let's just quickly um, review uh, what happens to this first group of believers and we'll look at these episodes in subsequent weeks in our series so when Jesus refers to 
Um, what Jesus refers to as being baptised in the Holy Spirit brings transformation to these first believers, meaning that they know supernatural power. This results in them being able to go beyond what they naturally would be able to do. That's so important, isn't it? He doesn't ask them to do it without the gift of the Holy Spirit, then being baptised in the Holy Spirit. What sort of things are we talking about? Well, Peter stands in front of thousands of people and boldly proclaims the truth about Jesus. Remember, he's the one who denied Jesus. He cowered with fear and shame. Look at him now. What a transformation. Later, we see others who Luke tells um, us come to be baptised in the Holy Spirit and they're speaking thereafter in prayer and praise languages that they haven't naturally acquired. Uh, that language acquisition has not been something that developed over their early years as infants. No, it's a gift of God. And they are able to speak prayers of praise and intercession, no doubt, with great freedom and fluency beyond their natural ability to speak of the things of God. What a great gift. We see others praising God with abandon and liberty. Um, and we see groups gathering to pray fervently. We see men appointed to oversee practical tasks because they are so obviously spirit filled, marked by grace, wisdom and faith in what they have been charged to do. Isn't that wonderful? We see miracles of healing and deliverance from demonization as well as people being raised from the dead. We see people being guided by the spirit of God, revealing to them where they should go next as they spread the good news about Jesus. Now, these are existing believers, followers of Christ, but then come to be baptised in the Holy Spirit and they are transformed as they know this supernatural power equipping them to go beyond what they themselves naturally are capable of doing but also would be inclined to do before. What a transformation. Let me just share briefly about my experience. Now some of the people that we read about in the book of Acts and some people I've talked to in my Christian life who've come to experience the baptism of the Spirit, they would clearly identify a very powerful experiential moment in their lives. It's an overwhelming experience for some. But guess what? Not for everyone. Not all people that I um, talk to about this would say, yeah, I just was overwhelmed. At the time. What they can say though is that their life thereafter was transformed. And I fit into that second category. I haven't experienced something overwhelming when I was prayed for or when I prayed myself to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what I can do is identify a moment in my Christian life after years of being a sincere follower of Christ where uh, there was um, clearly something that happened because thereafter my Christian experience was truly transformed. I would say it was revolutionised. I was not the same as I was before and therefore I would say that's when I was baptised in the Holy Spirit because that lines up with what I read in the scriptures in the New Testament in Acts for example. So this before um, my baptism in the Holy Spirit I read the Bible diligently every day. Um, I would pray and I had a list that I'd work through. I would um, I would praise God um, and worship. Uh, I thought, well, that's fitting. That's appropriate. He deserves it. I would um, endeavour to share my faith um, where I could. I thought that was something that I was obliged to do. But after being baptised in the Holy Spirit, suddenly there was a new sense of motivation um, and passion in all these areas so my bible reading um, took on a new lease of life the appetite was there to study the word of god uh, and um, I, I i felt a new motivation and desire to share my faith i wanted to take the youth group onto the streets where i i used to live before i did it because i thought we should do this we should do this i didn't enjoy it um didn't relish it but then suddenly i couldn't be held back we've got to go we've got to go we've got to go and do it and there was a new freedom and the fear of man had gone and there was a power in in my personal witness and in praise suddenly I realized I have a passion for God because he's got a passion for me and there was a freedom I didn't care what people thought about me if I lifted my hands if I jumped around if I bellowed out my praise to God hey there was just this great release 
Yeah, great release. And then prayer, yeah, just this conviction and passion to call on God and to um, to pray. Uh, that wasn't there before in the same way. So my Christian life was truly revolutionised by being baptised in the Holy Spirit. Before there was sincere uh, faith on my part, I knew Jesus. And those things I've described that I did, I, I did because um, yeah, I was a Christian. But things took on a whole new uh, lease of life, a new dimension once I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit. I've used this illustration before. Uh, bear with me as I use it again. I remember in my mid-twenties, I had a Vauxhall Corsa. Um, it, it was actually my first car, and it was the Mark One. It was the original model of the Vauxhall Corsa. It looks like a whistle. When you're six foot two and a half, getting into such a car isn't very easy. Um, it was one litre. Pulling away from junctions onto uh, national speed limit roads, big A roads, was, was exceedingly challenging because I'll pull out, nothing coming, and then before I know it, there's someone right behind me. I'm doing my best to get the car moving, but it lacked power. And trying to drive from, I don't know, like Manchester to Leeds, Yorkshire, across the Pennines uh, on the motorway uphill, it, it was exceedingly difficult. Um, this car lacked power. But then I was given a financial gift and I was able to buy a bigger car, uh, a Ford Focus 1.6, and it transformed my driving experience. The power was there under the bonnet. I could overtake on motorways. I could pull away from junctions and make good headway. And actually, it was a pleasure to drive. So there was the power and there was the pleasure in the driving because of the power. And for me, that's a great analogy of what I've described in terms of the change in my Christian life, thanks to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where... Um, before, yeah, it, it, it was something I did and it had to be done, I'm sure, I knew that. Um, but then I wanted to do these things with a new desire and there was a new liberty and a new sense of power and pleasure in knowing God and walking with him. So that's my experience. And now let me ask this, what about you? You know, this is not a matter of temperament or personality. Um, it's not about being an extrovert. It's about not you uh, in terms of personality, but about the person of the Holy Spirit living in you and actually filling you. In actual fact, you being baptised um, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you wish for new dimensions of freedom? Do you wish for new dimensions of motivation? Do you wish for new dimensions of conviction? Do you wish for new dimensions of passion? Do you wish for new dimensions of enjoying God and knowing his presence? Do you wish for these things? Have you ever experienced anything the like of which I'm talking about? Maybe you haven't been baptised in the Holy Spirit yet, even though you were a Christian. For me, I was a Christian for a good number of years before I was baptised in the Holy Spirit. What about you? Maybe you have experienced these things, things before, but you need to be refilled. You need to be baptised afresh in the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray right now for you. Uh, maybe you're on your own, maybe you're with someone else. Can I just encourage you right now to recognise the Lordship of Jesus. He reigns supreme on the throne at the right hand of God and therefore he's ushered in the age of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is available to us as he was available to the first group of Christians who needed his empowering presence to transform their Christian lives, that they might live the life that God had for them. And that's true for you and true for me. Maybe you're with someone else and they're next to you. Can I just say, don't worry about them. Uh, please, just right now, respond to what I've said and your Christian life could be transformed. Let's not settle for how things are. Let's come into the, the more that God has for us, even as we embark on this new year that we would be fully equipped, inspired by the Spirit. So I'm going to pray. Will you please just close your eyes, recognise the Lordship of Christ, humble your heart, hum be humble in your hearts and say, I need you, Lord. I want more of you, Lord. Fill me, baptise me with your Spirit today. Jesus is the one who baptises in the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Let's know that in our lives. So Lord God, thank you for what we've read today, what we've looked at today. Thank you for the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit for those first Christians 2,000 years ago and how it revolutionised their lives as the church was born in power. And we pray um, right now, acknowledging the Lordship of Christ and that he is the one who baptises in the person of the Holy Spirit. 
I pray for my friends right now uh, watching this broadcast. They would be baptised in the person of the Holy Spirit and know a revolution in their Christian lives. A revolution in their Christian lives in the way we've looked at today. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Maybe you will experience something. Feel something. <laughs> That's great. But let's look for fruit in our lives. Let's look for transformation in our Christian lives. That, that is the test. That's what will actually prove all decisive. Are we going to be the people of God that we can be? Thanks to the provision of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening this morning. If you've got any questions, feel free to make contact with me. Bless you.